let me just say one thing about giving. I have learned in my life, and uh, let me. throughout my ministry, and as I study the Bible, when I see Jesus looking at those who are putting money, remember? It impressed me that Jesus was just watching. Keep in mind that. As you put there, he's seeing it. And everybody was putting money, and then the lady, uh, widow put just a little tiny money there. It was all that she had. And Jesus said to his disciples, that widow gave more than everybody else. In other words, if I would like to have someone in my church, it would not be that those who gave so much money, but that widow. And I think the point is this, I learned in my life, you are never too poor that you cannot give something, not too rich that you cannot give more. And think about it. Everything is God's gift. Now, let us pray, and then I will, and my message today has ten points. <laughs> and then <I> say, now, <laughs> seven yesterday, ten tomorrow, on Sunday will be 17. No, 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 no. No, on Sunday will be five, the Lord will it. But let us pray. Dear Lord, we are thankful to you because you are the one who brought us into the net. You are the one who saved us. You are the one who empowered us. You are the one who made us fishers of men. And now, Lord, we are all here in your presence again. Asking you, O oh Father, in the name of your Son, that your Holy Spirit once more open our eyes to see, our minds to understand, our hearts to believe, our feet to immediately do it. For the sake of your glory, of your majesty, of your weight, of your worship, for the edification of your people and the salvation of those who do not know you yet across the street and around the world. And I ask you, Lord, that once more you may move in our midst and you may learn from your word how we do it. In Jesus' precious name we pray and in his name we wait. Amen. Now, last night I gave the exposition on Matthew chapter 4, 18 to 22. And I told you that the parallel text is Luke chapter 5, 1 to 11. Luke gives you more details about that experience. Now, I put in that order here because uh, uh, Matthew become, comes before Luke. But in reality... In the order, if you put the two texts together, what happened was really this. And I told you that as they were washing their nets, Jesus got their boats, made that boat the pulpit. Boats were there, he made it the pulpit. Stood up and preached the gospel to these people and he stopped. The Bible says, and I'd like you to open your Bibles in Luke chapter 5 because we're going to continue um, today and give you more practical applications. And the Bible says this, this in Luke chapter 5, verse 2, that Jesus saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. The nets were theirs. Come here, Mama. I call her Mama. And by the way, footnote, uh, don't think that my wife becomes a little bit upset when I tell about things that I told last night. No, she loves it. She tells me, yeah, no, don't worry. I'm the one who takes care of your food anyway. <laughs> but uh, listen, uh, back in there, and uh, the Bible says he got into the boat, preached it to them, and that's verse 4 that I have here. And that 4, he said, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets 
for a catch. In other words, there will be no doubt. And when Jesus saw, says, let launch out into the deep, because he was, he was really planning to, be, to bring a big, many, many fish. And they could not have a clue. And now, their responsibility was to get their nets, to do what Jesus said. Get the boat, get to the place, and just throw it. And Jesus warranted and guaranteed them a catch. That's amazing. And it happened. And in that context, therefore, is when P uh, Peter is so amazed what he did, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And in that context, Jesus looked at them and said, now follow me, I will make you fish of man. He could, Peter said, Lord, you know what? Be our partner. We can get a lot of fish everywhere. But Jesus didn't come here to make us rich. Jesus came here to save us. And he used all these means to leave it very clear. And this morning, I would like to invite you with me to, so how do you fish people? And that's the question here. And yesterday, I didn't give all the details to you because of the time. But one thing that is very clear in the Bible is, uh, is that the questions are, where do we fish people from? And Paul says, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, from condemnation to forgiveness and peace with God, from sinful living to be sanctified by faith in Christ. That's a big thing. How do you fish them? And Paul says, by testifying the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are they? They are everywhere. They are everywhere by testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. And the reason is this, the, the problem, the key problem, of every human being who ever lived after the fall, who is ever living today, or who will ever be living to the come of Christ, is one, my friend. It's not education, it's not money, it's not economy, it's not Obama, it's not uh, Donald Trump, it's not... The problem of every human being, the Bible says, is sin. We have rebelled against God. That's the problem. From the beginning to the end, the Bible is very clear. And when the Bible talks about sin, remember, it's not just sins in the sense that sins that we commit, several different kinds, but the Bible also refers to sin as a power that is slave to you and you cannot do anything to please God. It's a power. And Jesus says, if the sons of men set you free, you'll be free indeed. In other words, the problem is this. In Psalm 51, David says, in sin I was conceived. It's not that the relationship between their parents were sinful, but he says, I was born with this power of sin. And Paul says, the law is good, but the problem is that we are born with this problem, and we cannot fulfill the law. That's the problem of every human being. But the solution is one. And the solution was announced in Genesis chapter 3 by God himself. The solution is the seed of the woman. The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'd like you to keep in mind also that the Bible does not talk ab just about the problem of every human being. The burden that they, care, they carry. And the solution is only the seed of the woman who came in this world to seek and to save the lost. And everything he did, every sign and one is for the people to believe him. And by believing him to have eternal life. And life worth living and worth dying. Anywhere, anytime. But I want to tell you also that it's not just the, 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 the problem of every human being, the solution for that problem, but the means that God decreed even before the foundation of the world by which we are saved. And he is going to use servants. As a sin, seed of the woman, and servant. Servant through whom others may come to believe. The, the Lord is going to use you and me through the message that we proclaim. 
Because faith will come by hearing and hearing the word of God. And I like to keep in mind, and in that context, we'll become fish of man. We don't save anybody. We don't put fish in the, in, the, uh, in the net. We throw the net. Which means you tell people about Christ. You share, you preach, you testimony. You give your testimony. You, you proclaim. And that's the way it is done. And once you're saved, remember, you have no other option. Followers of Christ everywhere. Faces of men anywhere. Anywhere. Those who are not fishing, there is a great possibility that they are not following. And if they are following and not fishing, there is some, something is going on. And you have to go back and repent and ask the Lord to empower you. Because it says, follow me, I will make you fishers of men. There is no option. The one who efficaciously saves you is the one who efficaciously sends you. And this morning, I would like to go with you. Oh, it's here. In this principles of how do you do that. In other words, how do you fish people? And I'm going to start with you 10 biblical ways. Principles, pure and simple. What can each one of us do? And the Lord is amazed that the Bible teaches about it. Thank you. Deshaun Dyson. <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> and let me give you principles. I am assuming, let me tell you this, I am assuming this here. I'm assuming that, that when someone comes to the saving knowledge of Christ, no, that when someone comes into the net, you're going to see that the Lord Jesus has already used many circumstances, many peoples, many places, many experiences. It's like a, a, cha a, a, a chain with many links. When I talk with people, how did, how did you get to the knowledge? How did you get to know Jesus? And it's amazing. Because they're going to tell a lot of stories. If you think about Jesus, and the Lord has used many circumstances, sometimes different people, and means that come to that place. I always pray, Lord, in that chain, I want to be one of those links. I want to be one of those links. For example, how many people I know said, man, I came to the same knowledge of Christ when I was watching Billy Graham. When I went to see Billy Graham in Brazil. But what they forget is also, when I say, but why did you go to watch Billy Graham? And they say, I was invited. And they say, my mom was praying for me. You name it. I want to be one of these links. In one of them, even if I'm the last one. When this person came to the saved knowledge of Christ and now is he's going to grow in the followership as they follow Jesus Christ. But let me give you ten. And I believe all of these things that I'm going to share with you, all of you can get involved with. And one of the first things that I'm going to tell you is this. One thing that you can do is pray. Oh, my friend, it is not easy. Of course, it's easy to say, how do you do to do, pray? But have you realized that the most difficult things to obey in Christian living are not necessarily the most difficult to understand? The most difficult things to obey in Christian living is generally the most understood or the easiest to understand things. For example... If I ask you, if you want to grow in your intimacy with Christ, what should you do? And you say, of course you have to pray. Of course you have to pray. You have to talk with God. Secondly, you can say, I have to meditate in God's Word. I have to study God's Word. Of course, you have to hear from God. Simple. And you have to share the faith with other people. Yes. Very simple, my friend. Easy to do, huh? 
No. They're not easy. But I'd like to call your attention for that. Pray for unbelievers. And that's not difficult. And I hope and pray that you know people in your family, in your place of work, in your neighborhood, who are still lost. Begin to pray for them and pray for the Lord to open the door. You'll be surprised, my friend, what the Lord is going to do. Begin to pray for these people. That's the thing that even my grandchildren can do. Pray. And when I say pray, because I have many texts in the Bible. And if you ask me, why should I pray for the salvation of the unconverted, of the lost friends, of the, even my enemies, even unknown, un unknown people? Why should I pray for them? And I'm going to give you three reasons why you should pray for them. First, because only God is able to open the heart of sinners to heed the things spoken by us. You may throw the net, my friend, but only God can get and put the fish to get it. And I say that because Paul said, Luke says that in Acts 14, 27, 16, 14, you name it. When say, and God opened their hearts to believe. That's for what we pray. In other words, God is the only, keep in mind that, my friend, because many times we are so struggling because we don't see people getting converted as if we are the ones who are going to convert them. No, my friend, my responsibility is throw the net, share with the gospel, pray for them, persuade them, use all the kinds of illustrations that I can, but I know I cannot save them. I cannot bring conviction. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to use means. And it does not matter where you are, my friend. Here in Brazil, in China, wherever you are. That's the way it goes. And you have to keep in mind that God is the only cardiologist who is able to take a heart of stone and put a heart of flesh. And that's the way we pray. Oh, Lord, remove it. I have been praying for a friend of mine for many years. He was here at the, at the UMC as a researcher from Brazil. Came to do his postdoc, stayed here working for many years. Now he's back in Brazil. When at first I met him and his wife, we brought them to our house for dinner and we began to talk. And of course, we began to talk about Christ and stuff like, and other uh, subjects like this. Every time, and he would invite us to go to his house, and every time we sat together, we began to talk. And I remember many times that I was sharing the gospel with him and telling him, he would say to me, Elias, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. How do you do with this person? I continue to pray, Lord. He said, my friend, let me tell you, the Lord can take your heart of stone and put a heart of flesh. And every time he says, but I don't believe it. And then I would say to him, that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> Is it not? I'm sharing. I'm, I pray, oh, Holy Spirit, open his mind, open his heart. But I told him once, I said, listen. And by the way, that's what God says in Ezekiel. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And that's the way I pray. And what's my, my point? My point is to speak and to share the good news to the dry bones. And may the Spirit of God do it. And how many times I talk with him. And I'm still praying for him. And one day I told him, I said, listen, I'm not going to mention name because I know you're videotaping this stuff. I said to him, let me tell you, my friend, what I'm telling you is the truth. And I have no doubts whatsoever. And one day you will realize that is true. And I hope it not be too late. Because in the Bible tells about people who realize the truth too late. They were in hell. I'm still praying for him. And one reason why I believe, I pray because God is the only one who can open hearts of sinners. Secondly, I pray because the patriarchs, the prophets, Jesus, the apostles, prayed for and commanded us to pray for the lost. Isn't that amazing? The first intercession for nations that God is going to destroy is in Genesis. You don't need to go there. Genesis 18. God reveals to Abraham that in your seed all the nations of the world will be blessed. 
and announced the birth, the coming of Isaac. And immediately, the three, two of those angels was going to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy. And the Bible says that God began to reason with himself. Said, hey, you know, I promised that Abraham through his seed will be a blessing for all the nations. And now I'm going to destroy two nations. Should I hide it from Abraham? And he told Abraham, and what Abraham does? Began to intercede for those nations. That's the first intercession for nations in the Bible. Pray for the nations. But let me tell you, so many examples. But I'd like you just to open your Bibles in John 17. Because Jesus prayed for the lost. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus prayed for the lost. And not once, but before he goes to get salmon, go with me quickly. I'm going to mention this text on Sunday. But in John 17, and don't worry, I'll have to tell stories about praying for the Lord. It's unbelievable what God does. In John 17, Jesus prayed to the Father. This is the Lord's Prayer. The, le the longest prayer of Christ registered in the Bible, John 17. They pray in Matthew chapter 6. He taught us to pray. That's a prayer that Christ cannot pray. That prayer in Matthew 6, Christ does not pray that prayer. Because he can never say, forgive my debts or my sins. That he taught us. That he prayed. In the midst of that prayer, he talks about God's glory, how he saved his people. And in verse 9, listen to what he says. In verse 9 he says, I pray for them, for those who are saved now. I don't pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. He's praying for the church. And you have a list of things that he's praying for the church. But then when you come to verse 20, that impresses me very much. In verse 20 he says, I do not pray for these alone, for those who are already saved. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus was praying to sit in for the lost. Praise God. When we're sharing the gospel with the Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ, I know that my responsibility is to throw the net. And the Lord is interceding for me. And in some or another, prayed and praying for those whom he has called to believe. If Christ prayed, the Apostle Paul, remember, oh man, so many. Luke 23, remember when they were crucifying Christ, Christ says, forgive them, O oh Father, because they don't know what they're doing. That's a prayer. By the way, Jesus didn't forgive them. Forgive them, O oh Father, because they don't know what they're doing. For you to be forgiven, you have to repent. And praise the Lord for acts. When you go to Acts chapter 2 and 23, when those people, Peter, preach to them, you reject, you crucify the Lord, and then suddenly says, what can we do to be saved? Yes! Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they repent, and 3,000 people of those who really stood up against the Lord were saved that day. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Let me just read it to you. Why do I pray? Because the apostles prayed. Jesus commanded even pray for those who spitefully or spitefully use you and persecute you. But in Romans chapter 10, when Paul looked at the Israelites, as Israel as a nation, he says this, Brethren, my, right into the Romans, remember, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer of God for Israel is that they may be saved. You know, Lord, save them. And that's why I was just preaching the gospel to them. And this is my second reason. Because they prayed for the lost. And I hope and pray that you begin to do it. I don't know how many members you have here. But if I imagine. If you have, I don't know how many families. Can you imagine if every family here began to pray for people that they know are still lost. I hope and pray they're going to do it. It's part of the deal. It's part of the deal of throwing the net. And let me tell you my third reason very quickly. Because God answers the prayers according to His will. Especially the prayers 
that he commanded us to pray. When you pray for the lost, you're praying according to God's will. And I could tell you a lot of stories. But because of my time, I'm going to leave some other stories to highlight. But I could tell you a lot. It doesn't mean that every time you pray for someone, this person is going to be saved. That's not the point. But I can almost guarantee you they're going to see people coming. And I could tell you a lot of stories as coming together with my children and say, hey, give names of your friends that you know are still lost. And let us pray for them. And how God began to open doors to even to minister to their families. Oh, I could tell you a lot of stories, but let me go to the second point. Pray. This is something that everybody can do, even the children. Start doing that. It's biblical. Secondly, one thing that you can do it's invite someone or encourage someone to, inv to come to church and pick them up. And I'm going to tell you that it's biblical to invite people to come where God's people are congregated. By the way, I'm going to tell you a study done here in the USA, and it simply astonished me. And I'm going to, Tom Rainer wrote, a book a few years ago and he did a very good research I only quote research that I know are done scientifically that you have a, just a small margin of error and let me just highlight for you what he said listen to this this is in your essay he said this church members are not equipped to be inviters Only 21% of active churchgoers invite anyone to church in the course of a year. In general, because you have a special program like Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, choir, whatever it is. But only 2%, generally speaking, okay? Only 2% of the church members invite an unchurched person to church. Now, they did a research among unchurched people in USA. And ask the question, if you have ever been invited, would you consider going to a church to attend something? And listen to what he found. 96% of the unchurched are at least somewhat likely to attend church if they are invited. If our church is close to accurate, the implications are staggering. I'm not talking about the USA. Over 153 million people would start attending church if they were invited. But we only invited our kind of people. Serious business. Let me say something about it. You have your Bibles? Open your Bibles in Psalm 122. Ah, I have so many texts, but I'm going just to highlight one, tell a story, and go ahead. Psalm 122. And you know, these are one of those songs of ascent. In other words, you have several psalms here. After the Psalm 119, start on 120, that usually God's people sing as they were going in procession to the temple. As they were going together, they began to sing those psalms. Therefore, they call the Psalms of Ascent. As they're going up to the temple or to Jerusalem. And one of these psalms is Psalm 122. And listen, verse 1. Sometimes we read, you don't pay attention to this. One of the things that was saying was this. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, that's David who wrote this psalm. Anyway, say, of course. He's a believer, my friend. He knows God. He knows God. When someone would invite him to go to the house of the Lord, he would be glad to do it. And the idea is that people are coming and say, come to the house of the Lord. And he says, I'm glad when they call me. By the way, are you glad when people call you to come to the house of the Lord? To God's people? But say, Dr. Medez, you cannot use that. I can. Let me tell you why. Because you're forgetting the other side of, the, of this verse. The point is that there were people inviting others to come to the house of the Lord. Now those who are the Lord would be glad. And the others, I don't know, but they were inviting people to come to the, the house of the Lord. 
And by the way, you go through the Bible, I put several texts uh, in the previous slide. You can go and check all these texts, how Andrew brought his brother to Jesus, how four men brought the paralytic to Jesus, how the Samaritan woman, the Elizabeth Taylor of the Bible, invite the people from Samaria to hear Jesus. Let me tell you a story here. It's very dear to my heart. My uncle, which was the youngest brother of my father, my grandfather had several children, about five or six, I, I forgot the number. But that's not matter. But this young man was the youngest one. My grandfather was a very faithful elder of the Presbyterian Church. My father, by God's grace, remained faithful. But this young brother didn't care for church. Very involved with women and stuff like that. He went to the became a sheriff, sheriff and became a commandant, what do you call commandant, of the, the, of, the, of the police. What do you call it? All right, something like this. <laughs> uh, the big, he was the big boss. Listen to this. Got married, children, but no church. Never cared. And he was very well known on the second large city of my home state. As one of the chief uh, men for the whole police in the region. One day I received an invitation. I was in Northeast Brazil. One day I received an invitation to preach in a church in that town. And then I thought about my uncle. I called him. I said, uncle, I'm going to preach in one of the, this, this, the churches here in your town. Would you mind if I stay with you? I did it purposely. <laughs> because I could stay in a hotel, could stay in somebody else of the church. But I said, now that's my time to stay at his house. He said, of course, son, come, we'll be welcome. And he picked me up at the bus station. I went to his house. He's there, his wife and the children. And uh, I was going to preach Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And on Friday, I got there on Friday morning. And I said, uh, Uncle, I would like to invite you to come to church with me tonight. You take me to church. I said, of course, son, we're going to take you to church. And he took me to church with the whole family that Friday. Never had gone to church, my friend. But he took me. And he stayed there and I preached the gospel. On Saturday, he took me again. On Sunday, he took me in the morning and in the evening. On Monday morning, I said, thank you, uncle, left that city. And I didn't hear about my uncle a few years ago. As a matter of fact, later I heard that he was an elder in the church. And I was so glad because we were praying for him. And a few years ago, I was with my brother-in-law passing through that city. I said, is not my uncle living here? He's now in the 80s, by the way, just for you to know. He's in the 80s. He said, yes. He said, could you pass by his house? It's a long time. The last time I saw him when I came here several years ago to preach. He said, yes. He took me to his house. He was not there. But the wife is there. The married children were there. And when I came there, they gave me a big hug. And one of them said, Elias... Do you remember? I said, I'm so glad that all of you are in the church, that my uncle is an elder of the church, the treasurer of the church. I'm so glad. And he said, that's your fault. I said, why? I said, do you remember the day that you came to our house? And we invite dad to come to church. And from that day on, dad never stopped going to church. God brought him to Jesus, and he's an elder. This year, was this year or last year? Last year, I was preaching that city again. I called, he could not come because he was a little bit sick. But I was preaching in a conference for 10,000 people. I have never been so, with, among so many people. 10,000, my friend, in front of you. 10,000. You have that for the whole week. I was preaching twice. Josh McDowell was there as well from America. And now his son, who is also an elder, and he is now really the, the position that his father had, only a little bit higher because he's now for the whole region. He called me on the, to the hotel and said, Elias, I want to see you. And he came to see me. 
committed believer. He said, man, I, I'm so glad to see you. He said, the Lord has done so many things in my life. And it even started when I said, uncle, would you go to church with me? Invite someone. Don't worry, I'm going to stop by 9.30. Third, just an example. I could tell you a lot of other examples. But this is one that has marked my life. Invite someone for dinner, for brunch or for lunch, etc. And pray that the Lord is going to open the door for you to share the good news with that person. And by the way, and if you don't know how, invite Albert for the lunch. And say, Pastor, I'm inviting someone, and I would like you to be there to pray and to tell these people about the Lord. Yes. Oh, it's still in here. Get somebody. And it's biblical. Let me tell you why. Have you realized how many places Jesus sat down with people to eat? And let me give an example that many times we forget. Open your Bibles in Matthew chapter 9. Oh, you're going to, to love it. Oh, how I love Matthew. Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, you have the call of Matthew. Listen, Matthew chapter 9. Let me just read very quickly this verse, 9 to 13. And Jesus passed on from there. He saw a man named Matthew. I'm so impressed how many times he, he saw a man. He heard someone. He saw someone. He saw a man named Matthew, probably in Capernaum. He was probably a tax collector in the city that Jesus was living. Sitting at the tax office. And he said to them, follow me. And of course, probably has heard about Jesus. And the Bible says, see, so he arose. He arose and followed him. Now listen what Matthew tells about this experience in verse 10. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, but he didn't say, in my house. Have you realized that? He's so humble. But I'm going to tell you that it's in his house. The Bible says so. Now it happened, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, Why? Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn that this means I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why I'm eating with them. Now go to the parallel text. By the way, every time you study the Bible, go to the parallel text. Now go to Luke. Go to Luke with me. Oh, my friend. I'm telling you, it's a biblical principle. It's not just because it, don't do something just because it works. But do it because it's biblical. And now you know it's going to work in some way or fashion. Do it because it's biblical. Luke chapter 5, the same story, verse 27. Oh, you love it. Listen to this. I'm going to read to you because the Bible convicts you. After these things, he means Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, because that's the other name he had, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he left, rose up, and followed him. Verse 29, then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. Got it? And what he did, he invited all his friends to who? To hear the Lord Jesus. It's biblical. I could tell you a lot of stories. Even here in Jackson, Mississippi. But I'm going to jump. Because I hope that you begin to invite people to come for dinner and brunch and lunch. So that they may know about your Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. It's biblical. It's biblical. And sometimes I know that sometimes uh, unplanned and unexpected opportunities appear. And by the way, if you used to do family worships, family worship, it would be a great plus in your life. If you have not done that, ask the people here, say, how can I begin doing family worship? It is a great blessing. 
You know, when I invite someone to come, and many times I ask my daughter when she was at Belhaven College, bring on the weekends your friends to our house. And many times she would call us Saturday and tell my wife, I'm bringing 10 people to eat with us. 10 young. And I told her many times, bring especially those who are not saved. And they, she would tell them and say, listen, my mother and my father are inviting us to come to, to lunch. And she's going to prepare all Dutch lunch or a, or a Brazilian lunch, whatever it is. Would you like to come? And of course they want to come. And then my sister, my daughter would say to them, listen, but when you come to my house and you're going to eat, my father is going to pray. Not because you're there. Because that would be a hypocrite. But because he always pray before he, we eat. And after that, he's going to read the Bible, not because you're there, but because that's the way he does. And my brothers and sisters, how many students came? And we prayed. And then I read the Bible, and it's amazing how questions begin to come. At the table, just keep doing that. Start family worship. And take advantage of every meal with your wife and children. Now, I have so many stories, but I'm going to leave these stories off. But you, you got the point. It's biblical. It's biblical. Third, fourth. Fourth, I would like to tell you is this. Get involved with the friends of your children, of your husbands and co-workers. I love when Joshua says, as for me and my house, will serve the Lord. It's amazing. Read Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy some. In other words, I see here the value of domestic worship with our children. Bring their friends to eat at your house. You know, my mother, you okay, my mother is 86 years old. Ligon Duncan came to preach in my hometown when we have a general assembly of my denomination. I took him for a Wednesday night to preach in my hometown. Two hours drive, I brought him, and he had to spend night there. And my mother said he has to sleep in our house. I don't, I don't, he is not going to a hotel. And Ligon Duncan said, Ligon, you cannot go to a hotel here, my friend. You have to stay at my house, my parents' house. No problem. My parents now have a very nice house. With a suit, suite there, he stayed, and I said, Ligon, let me tell you ahead of time, you're not going to speak for five minutes with my mother without hearing about Jesus. And I asked Ligon, you can't. She is going to challenge immediately, my friend. He's going to open her mouth and tell. And my mother used to do this, son, the big, my father was working for, uh, uh, retired in Brazil, working as a judge for social security case for the government. And then he had a lot of trips, of meetings and conferences and stuff, and my mother always went with him. And my mother would go with him, and she would go and stay with the other ladies while the guys are doing their business there. And my mother said, son, I love to stay with those ladies because some of them are really clueless. They have a lot of money, but they don't have Jesus. And one thing that I like is when, because when we come together, we begin to talk about our children and grandchildren. He said, I love when they ask about my family. And they said, he said, and when they asked, what about your children? Oh, my oldest one is a pastor. And you know what he does? Boom! <clears throat> I remember when our granddaughter went first time to, to school. She was four years old. Went to a, I'm not going to mention the school. In Clinton was a Baptist school anyway. And she went. And the first time when she came back, the first day I asked her, I said, my grandbaby, let me ask you a question. How was school today? The first time he went to school, he said, it was great, Dad. Oh, grandfather. She called me vovô, which is grandfather in Portuguese. It was great, vovô. Then I asked the question, did your teacher pr pray? Did your teacher pray before she started class today? She said, No. I said, man, that's not public school. I said, now tomorrow when you come back, would you please ask her why she didn't pray? <laughs> Little ones are great, my friend. And they do it. And they do it. And you can train these little missionaries. And they do it. 
Is it not true? They go and do it. Footnote. You know John Perkins, don't you? I love that brother. And I met him the first time in 1989. I heard his testimony. He came to the saved knowledge of Christ when he was 27 years old. In California. Fleeing from here, his brother had been shot. And you know how he came to the saved knowledge of Christ, let me tell you, because I heard from him. He was there, lost, with his mother and everybody there, but not his mother. His mother had passed away a long time ago. But he was there, 27 years old, married, had a son called Spencer, who later God took home, I think. And as far as I know, Spencer was three years old. And by God's providence, this little one was invited by one of those. The U.S. missionaries? Yes, to the Bible, the new Good News Bible Club. And this little boy went there. And suddenly, John Peck said, Shall I begin to see change in my son? Something was happening in his life. And I want to know what was happening in his life. Because... He, he was doing things. He was becoming such a kind of young uh, this boy that I would like to be able to make him that way. And I could. And I want to know how it happened. And one day this little boy invited him to go to church with him because these people began to bring little Spencer to the church. And he invited his father to come to the church. And John Perkins went to the church. And the Sunday school teacher began to talk with him because he wanted to know more. And then that's the way he was introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't despise the little ones. Now, she went back, came back the following day. The following day said, did you ask the teacher? I said, yes, Grandpa, I asked. What did she say? He said, oh, we pray when you go to eat. I said, very nice. By the way, get involved with your children's and grandchildren relations. Then I said, Little one, is everybody, how many people you have, how many kids you have in your class? She said about 12, and she already memorized the name of all of them. <laughs> By the way, she learned to read before she went to school. That's amazing. That's another story. Um, and I said, is everybody, does everybody in your, in your class know the Lord Jesus Christ? And you know what she said? I think she understood about Bible Belt. She said, of course, this is a Christian school. So what? It's a Christian school, Volvo. Of course everybody there is a believer. I said, I want you to go back and ask three questions for them, but not during the class. But when you have a break, I want you just to talk with each one of them and ask these questions. Very simple. You ask, for example, something like, hey, do you have a Bible at home? It's a question like that. Or, do you go to church? Or, do you know Jesus? Just this. This, this little one are tremendous. She went back, came back, and I asked her, is everyone, did you talk with them? I said, yes, Grandpa, I talked with them. And I said, is everyone a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? I said, no, Grandpa, there are three people there that do not know Jesus, do not have a Bible, and don't go to church. And two of them were Indians from, from India. I said, what are you going to do now? She said, I don't know. I said, let us pray for them. And that the Lord may open an opportunity. There was an opportunity. She was invited for one of those birthdays. By the way, I, I, I'm just telling you about opportunities that the Lord gives through the little ones. Get involved with your kids and say, what are you going to give to this, this boy, this Indian boy? I said, oh, I'm going to give a gift and the card. I said, that's nice. But what else can you give to him and to the family? Let us go and buy a Bible, a nice Bible, and go to give and tell them this is the best gift I can give you. That's it. And let us pray to see what's going to happen. I don't know what happened to the family, but the point is this. Get involved with the friends of your children, grandchildren, your husband, co-workers, you name it. Fifth, use the resource that I'm going to run, okay? Use the resource that God put under your care as a steward, your house. Oh, man, don't you love this? This is the story of Cornelius. Cornelius. He used his house. And you have so many stories like this. 
And I tell people, use your house to host people for Bible study, for example. Advertise your faith in your properties. I remember when we, now there's another story, leave it aside. I don't have time to tell this story. If you don't know how to lead a Bible study at your home, invite somebody from the church, say, hey, use my house to start a Bible study. I can invite my neighbors. Use your house. I mean, experience here, but then, in other words, not only your house, and I say use your house for family and friends worship, use the resources that God put under your care, steward your telephones. Have you ever thought about it? I have told that story here before, but I'm going to, to share. Now they don't call me anymore on the phone. But there was a time, remember, they were all telemarketers? Oh, I love. I, I was really. No, I didn't love the telemarketers. The beginning. As soon as I got employed by, the RT, by RTS, I realized that everybody knew I was employed in USA. And then call, credit cards, you name it, phone, calling me. And I was really getting upset till one day I realized something. My son was a dad. When the telemarket called you, don't worry, I'll take care of it. They said, wait, 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 wait a minute. I learned at least three things in USA about telemarketers. One is that when they call you, they are monitored. They cannot be rude to you as a customer. Secondly, they cannot hang up on a customer. They can lose their job. And the third thing I learned in USA that is very good is that the customer is always right. <laughs> Said, so don't worry, let them call. And one day, oh, almost every day, and then in the night, someone called when I came back from work, and someone called, it was someone from AT&T, whatever it was, and says, Mr. Medeiros is from AT&T. I said, all right. I'm going to let you speak, and after that, I have a question for you. Is that okay? He said, yes. <laughs> after this day, I didn't ask this because at the end, they, many times they said, do you have any questions? And I remember this guy at TNT finished very quick because I knew he was reading something. And when he finished, do you have any questions? I said, yes, I have. It was sun Monday. I said, did you go to church yesterday? <laughs> I said, I beg your pardon, sir? <laughs> I said, today is, is Monday. Yesterday was Sunday. Did you go to church yesterday? I said, no, sir, don't go to church. I said, why not? And then I talked very quickly with him. I said, you know, I think you were right. I think you should go back to church. By the way, through this, I met brothers and sisters. There was one girl that called me with a very for an African accent. I couldn't realize that, but she was living in USA. And when she finished, said, do you have any questions? I said, yes, where are you from? I said, I'm originally from Africa. And I said, by the way, do you have a Bible? Because one day I sent a Bible to India because of that telemark telemarketer. I said, she said, uh, yes, sir. And my father is a pastor. Then suddenly I met a sister in Christ over the phone who is a telemarketer. But anyway, use my friend, use your computer, telephones, use your uh, whatever transport you have, in other words, to bring people. And you can find this. All right, that's too many. <laughs> use the resource, use your computer. Remember that God's servant use also technology. And that's all right. Use computer. You have your emails, you have Facebook, you have all the social media. Please don't waste your time. And when you are in a Facebook, remember the question that I asked yesterday for Jesus about Jesus. What are you doing? You can use it for God's glory. Now, if you don't have not our thing, write a letter to someone. Write a letter to someone. Don't worry, I'm going to finish here. Write a letter to someone. I'm going to tell you two stories about it. You know about Derek Thomas? And I'm going to summarize the story of Derek Thomas because I have heard it several times. He was away. He never go to church. His parents were not church people. Had a good friend, high school. They went to different colleges. One day he received a letter from this friend who was in high school. And his friend talked about, uh, about his college. And at the end, bottom line, he put a P.S., I'm now a Christian. And Derek Thomas read that and sent him a letter back. Said, what do you mean I'm, not a, I'm now a Christian? He explained a bit, sent two books to Derek Thomas. Derek Thomas, read those books. And he decided to get a Bible. Went to a 
bookstore. I got a Bible. I said, I began to read. And I closed myself in the room. I, he was at home. There was, I think, Christmas time. I don't know what time was it. And I began to read. And as I was began to read, I realized I was really a sinner. And I began to read and realized that Jesus really died and paid for my sin. And that day, I cried and I bowed down before the Lord and surrendered my life to Him. And I went to church on Sunday. Liberal church! And the guy tried to persuade him that was nothing. But by God's grace, he met people from uh, one of those type, RUF, that discipled him. And now you know Derek Thomas. And Derek Thomas heard about RTS when he was still a college student. And Sam Patterson here was visiting there and was speaking for the young people. And, and Derek said, I want to be a pastor. I want to go to your seminary. A seminary was committed to the Word of God. And he said, Sam Patterson came back and said, come. He said, I, I am engaged. He said, get married and come. <laughs> and he opened all the doors for Derek Thomas to come to study at RTS Jackson. He finished, went was a senior pastor in uh, uh, was the city there in Ireland for many years. Came here to preach in the conference. We invited him to be a professor. Rest is his story. And everything started with a PS in the letter. I'm now a Christian. <sighs> I'm going to tell you one more story. Now let me tell you the, the rest of the points, and I'm going to tell you a story about letters. Buy and distribute Bibles and good evangelical literature. Oh, I could go to so many places. Yes. Just take the initiative to talk with someone what you already know and want to know anywhere. You remember examples and report in the script. Just talk with people. Take wise and proper advantage of special occasions when you are invited. Jesus took advantage of all of them. And finally... What do you do when you are in a restaurant, medical office, hotels? And I tell you, Jesus didn't go to restaurants, but he ate with those who invited him for dinner. Jesus didn't stay in the hotels, but he stayed at homes, bed and breakfast, by the way. Jesus did not visit medical office nor hospitals, but he received and visited many who were sick. Let me just finish with this story, because I have so many here to share with you. I'm going to tell two, and I'm going to finish. This is about the letter. In 2001, you know what happened 2001, September 2001. That 2001, the beginning of the year, my son decided to enlist to the army in USA. He wanted to be in the army. He really wanted. And he enlisted. As he was enlisted there, the sergeant here in Jackson said, listen, they're going to boot, I'll say boot camp? Is that what they call it? Boot camp. It will be tough. You're not going to contact him, but you can write a letter to him. And they will give it to him. And my wife began to write a letter every single day to Johnny. And once in a while, I will write something there. And one day, I don't know why, I said, uh, um, I said, I wrote something. I said, Johnny, is there anybody in your, whatever you call it, company, whatever it is, that has not received a letter from anybody? And he wrote back to me, said, there is a young man here who has not received a letter from anybody. He said, give me his name. And he sent me his name. Then I decided to write a letter to this guy. And I wrote a letter. I said, listen, I'm going to, with my wife to Kentucky, etc., for this conclusion of your boot camp. And I'm taking something for Johnny. And I'm like, very much interested to take something for you. He replied this letter. It's May 9, 2001. It says, dear Mr. Medeiros, thank you very much for the time you took to write me this epistle. It was not a big letter. It is true that I'm from South Africa, but I am born in East Africa, Kenya, before my parents migrated to South Africa. Hence, my accent and language in Swahili, Swahili is semi-Arabic tongue, mostly used in the island of Zanzibar, Mombasa, Malindi, and Pomba in East Africa. I lived in South Africa for four and a half years, for four and five, for four and five years in Swaziland. I have visited Morocco, Belgium, before I came to America, where I have permanent residence in Philadelphia. I was born 19 years ago. The month of Iris. By the way, Johnny told me that he declared himself an atheist. And by, just to provoke, I put at the end of my letter when I read, wrote, The Lord willing, I'll be there. 
And then he said to me, my family, what come do to that uh, celebration due to the nature and situation of their jobs? I hope to see you and your wife on that day. And then he said, because he said, you want me to take any? He says, my wants are few and so are mine. John said, that, that you have to see what happened. He never received a letter. Suddenly we are all there because they started to give him letters and call my name and start call Magui. And he looked at the first letter. It was a letter from me. He got the letter, opened, and said, Johnny, it's a letter from your father. <laughs> Medeiros. Medeiros called Johnny, not Johnny. Medeiros. It's a letter from your father. And he says, my ones are few and so many. I have learned to live on less and hope to preserve this virtue. I therefore wish to let you know that by writing this letter, you gave a gift worth remembering. And my, with immense gratitude, wish that you should not bother yourself because of me. I met him there. And on May 18, 2001, I wrote a letter, another letter telling a little bit about my life. I was 50 years old and tell about what really kept me going as uh, the Lord. And he said, I'm not trying to, to convert you, but I want you to know the reason of my life, etc. Now, September 11 came. It is 2001. On 13 of September 2001. Two days after September 11, I received a letter from Magui. And I'm going to finish with this letter. Dear Mr. Medeiros, hoping that you are fine and good health, you and your family, I wish to write you this letter after a long time. I have graduated my course in automated logistics, but I've been held for airborne training. Although life hasn't changed, much time since the last time I met you, I have nevertheless time to compass, to consider my indifference in the spiritual welfare, especially my own. September 11 came, two days after this. I received a letter from one of your students because I had somebody who could write in Swahili and say, write a letter to this guy. And haven't gathered enough courage to write back, but I hope to write if it all, all will. All will. I haven't got words enough to express my sincere gratitude for your concern in my life and the destiny of my soul. Last night, September 12th, this was right after September 11th, I completed reading a book by Francine Rivers called The Voice in the, Mo the Wind. The main character was a Jewish called Hadassah who after her family got killed in Jerusalem by Titus, the emperor's son, was enslaved to Rome and lived in a rich man's house. She lived under numerous tempests and threats and thoughts. And through these, she outlived humanity for the sake of her Christian faith. Before she died in the arena, mauled by lions, she explained what love means to one of her admirers. And she talked of how love is patient, kind, how it does not act unbecomingly or seek its own. It's neither provoked nor take into account the wrong done, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but in truth. It becomes all things and hopes. And as I close my book and focus on the life I have lived, I realized the ignorance I have had, the impatience, hatred, and the numerous injustice I have done, unlike Hadassah. I borrowed the Bible, but I could not find the words I was looking for, and my heart was yawning to find them. Frankly, I perused, but failed again. I placed the Bible on the table and decided to write to you. It's two days after September 11. I wonder why God in His creation, by the way, this is a former atheist. <laughs> I wonder why God in His creation made confusion be part of man. And with uh, different people and beliefs and with these different religions. What is right which is applicable to men who want to live honorably before their maker? Why Christianity? These are some of the many things I have to wonder about. I wish I could tell you more. But there is always limits to everything with a start. May God bless you for your understanding and fatherly concern. Give my sincere regards to your wife and family. I have lost contact of Johannes Medeiros through training, but I hope you'll greet him on my behalf and may the God that you pray have an upper hand on your daily judgments and duties to your family as a husband and father. And I reply that letter, given all the instructions he need. I have this, I reply that on September 19, I'm not going to read it to you. 
But everything starts just with a letter. You can do something. Let us pray. Dear Lord, there is no hope. There is no joy. There is no life worth living without Jesus. And you have granted us this great joy. And you have seen so many ways by which you can share that joy with people. And Lord, help us when you leave here today to say, Lord, I know I can throw the net. I can pray. I can invite. I can write. I can use my WhatsApp, my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram to let people know about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And help us to grow, Lord, in our intimacy with you so that we may always have a word to tell people. Help us, O oh Father, to launch into the deep our nets for a catch. In Jesus' precious name we pray and we praise you. Amen.